Hi everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome to the session. Um, my name is Claire Dooley, um, and I'm the technical manager for this side event, um, uh, which is um, going to be an amazing side event on um, agricultural policies and outcomes in sub-Saharan Africa, um, chaired by Mark Courier. Um, thank you for taking part in ANH 2022. Uh, we're looking forward to a really interesting discussion today. Thanks so much. So I will uh, hand over to you, Mark. Yes, thank you, Claire. Uh, we are pleased that uh, we have uh, technical support from the African uh, Nutrition and Health ANH Academy. So that is uh, pleasant and we are appreciative of that. We also appreciate the Academy for giving us this uh, slot. So we are appreciative. Uh, what I'll do is um, just to give you the guidelines for the day. Uh, this is a side event of the AERC on a, a relationship between agricultural policies and nutrition outcomes. There are some studies that we did and we would want to share them uh, in this conference. So um, we have our executive director, Professor Njigunandungu, is going to make a few remarks. Then we'll begin and there are about three presentations. Then we'll give a time for question and answer session. Then we shall close. We just have an hour, so we'll not uh, spend a lot of time uh, with administrative work. Otherwise, the time slots are just 15 minutes for every presentation. So without much ado, uh, uh, we we'll, let's allow Professor Njigunandungu, the executive director of the AERC, African Economic Research Consortium to make some opening remarks. Welcome, Professor. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, everyone. I'm very happy that um, ANH uh, has been uh, has been has generously around as a slot. And uh, what I wanted to do because of the time uh, space, uh, let me see how I can start this. I just wanted to share a few a few slides. Mostly, I'm going to talk about ARC. And more importantly, I'm going to show exactly what we have been doing in this, why, why, why it, become, it has become very important for us to focus on the area that is creating convergence with ANH um, uh, Academy. I'm very happy that at least we are able to connect with the nutritionist because essentially for us AERC, we are actually uh, economists, but we did know that once we come together with the, with the nutritionist, we are going to have some uh, very, very important congruence or convergence. The, the project we're talking about, for us, AERC, we have covered since, uh, for, for a couple of years, is agricultural policies and nutrition outcomes in Sub-Saharan Africa. And here, what we have done is actually to bring in some uh, uh, researchers to, to, to research on specific areas, one in their own respective countries or region, and then share with, share with us. It was funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So we used it as one to, to showcase policies, but more importantly, to actually build capacity for researchers in this area. And that's why we feel that is very, very important. But before I do that, let me also talk a little bit, a little bit about AERC. And AERC was established in 1988. So we are celebrating our 34 year of existence. It is not a profit institution, but it's a capacity building network. And we build capacity through research and graduate training in economics. And we do this through collaboration across universities, across uh, institutions, and across individuals, both in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa and uh, in the rest of the world, some of whom form a network of resource persons that support ARC research uh, capacity building. And we, what we'd like to do is actually to build that capacity that is going to help economic policy making in critical institutions in Sub-Saharan Africa. We do believe, and we, our initial belief is that we can have a critical mass in public sector and national think tanks. And then it means that we can actually improve the policy environment. We have three program, three program areas. First is research, then the other one is graduate training in economics and applied economics. And then the other one is community, communication and policy outreach. Let me perhaps provide some details about each of them because each of them have different modality, delivery modalities. Research, we have collaborative research, and this is where we choose a topical issue that can uh, produce important policy uh, outcomes, and especially the one that is currency with the 
kind of current, uh, current policy constraints, for example, right now we are dealing with, for example, poverty in Africa, growth, volatility of growth, we are dealing with COVID-19, we are dealing with health issues, we are dealing with climate change, those are topical issues of the day that can produce policies. And what we do in collaborative research is get experts all over the world and let them uh, come up with guiding uh, framework papers or frontier knowledge. Then we use that to guide the country case studies. And in that stage, we want to bring senior policymakers. We show them where is the frontier knowledge and then evidence from case studies. And then we actually then tell them this is a policy design and we can actually even discuss and uh, uh, accept implementation. The other one is thematic research for our career researchers. We have different thematic groups. And what we do is to ask researchers, young researchers to enter into this fray. There are five thematic areas and they can develop the proposals in areas that excite them. The areas that excite them also should be the areas they are good at. And we're going to look at the, uh, at the proposals and we, can pro we provide grants on the basis of the quality of the proposal. Collaborative training program, we have a collaborative masters in economics, this was started in 1993. We have collaborative uh, MSA in agriculture and applied economics. This was started around 1997. And uh, and collaborative PhD program, this was started in 2002. So we have a family of researchers and trainers and even people working in the public sector that have, are alumni of these training programs. We also have policy outreach. We have to disseminate our work. And we do this through senior policy seminar we can even organize regional policy workshop and we do organize or even support national think tanks when they organize or even other or even universities when they organize national policy workshops so that we can disseminate. Let me talk about the projects that is here in front of us, agriculture and food policy analysis for nutrition outcome in Africa. And this project was started in 2016 and um, this research on agricultural food and nutrition policies in, in sub-Saharan Africa for us is very, very important. And it has opened an opportunity for new, new networks, including nutritionists and even health people. And we're happy that we are now working with Agriculture, Nutrition and Health Academy. But we have, been, we have reached out to nutritionists of all us, and we are so, so happy about it. And since then, the ARC and the network members have participated in diverse activities where they have presented their own papers, their own research papers, we have become members in uh, ANH scientific committee, and uh, we periodically provide uh, session, ch session chairs and even panelists in conference round tables. And um, I'm sure we'll have a chance to propose ANC the conference or continue to do that, or even organize side events like the one that we. And uh, what we realized in this project is that it's a multidisciplinary nature. We focus very much on the economics and essentially when ARC started, we are so much on macroeconomics and we went into applied areas. But we find that now we have found ourselves using agriculturalists, especially uh, uh, economists and also agriculturalists, nutritionists and health and other disciplines when we come back to address the issues of uh, nutrition outcomes. We are very happy about that. We are happy to link with other stakeholders in research and policy environment, and, 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 and policy environment, especially focusing on nutrition. That's why we are happy that we are collaborating with Food and uh, Environment Research Network. We are collaborating with FAO, which is monitoring and uh, analysis of food and agricultural policies, predictive methods and metrics in for agricultural nutrition actions. We are happy that we are also working closely so that we're going to have an outlet for our papers in the African Journal of Agriculture, Nutrition and Development, as well as the Food Policy Journal that we are currently working on the papers. Today, we are going to share a few papers that have been accepted in the special issue of the Food Policy Journal. There are three papers, and you can see them here, and they will be presented by Paul, Haji, and Elias. We'll be happy that they will present these papers so that we see exactly what's the kind of output that we have. And of course, these papers have been de developed through a collaborative framework where we use resource persons to, to look into the papers. And we're happy about the, 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 the food policy special issue on the nutrition impacts of agricultural food and nutrition processes in Sub-Saharan Africa. And for me, I'm very happy because essentially, it is going to give us a foot map or, or, or should I say or, uh, a foothold in terms of showcasing the kind of work we do, which is actually meant for capacity building 
But more importantly, we also want to reward those who manage to put their papers or even their publications in uh, refereed journals. And uh, that's for me very, very, for us, that is very, very important. I also want to thank those who have supported us in this special issue, especially the editor in chief who has still provided guidance and uh, encouragement, Chris Barrett. And of course, the managing editor, our director of training, Theo, Theophil, and also the other supporting guest editors, Ralph Harunan and Mark Correo. I'm very, very happy about that. I'm supposed to be, I'm, I'm also part of the team there, but I'm very happy that uh, this has worked. And it's a culmination of a lot of many years of trying to push our young researchers into uh, publishing very high quality papers and even putting them in a, in a journal for us is a success story because it should be widely read. But more importantly, it increases the prowess of their research capability. Having said all that, and because I'm watching time as Mark Correo said, let me say from the East African side, Asante Sana, and I'm very happy I'm going to participate in this forum. Thank you very much and good morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Njaguna, our Executive Director at the AERC. Uh, you have given us uh, uh, the remarks, and we are now at a good position to proceed uh, with the presentations. So we will invite the first, first presenter, uh, that is Paul Enkebe from the University of Development Studies uh, uh, from Ghana. So without much ado, uh, Paul, the floor is yours. You have 15 minutes, and then we'll go straight to the other presentation then we shall open the floor for discussion. So Paul, please take the, the floor. Thank you, Mark, for the opportunity. The topic is impact of community development initiatives and access to community markets on household food security and nutrition in Ghana. Uh, my colleague is also with us, uh, Dr. Yazid Abdomoumi. My presentation will take this form. I'll talk about the introduction and motivation then look at the context and the data, then briefly talk about the methodology, then move on to the results, key findings, and some uh, concluding remarks. Africa still has a, a lot of uh, malnourished people. As of 2019, we had uh, over 250 million people who were malnourished, and a greater chunk of that, up to 93%, are living in sub-Saharan Africa. And we know the consequences and effects of uh, undernourishment. And some suggestions have been put forward in terms of interventions, including community development interventions and market access. By community development intervention initiative, I'm referring to government and communities coming together to construct community farms, storage facilities, or extension of uh, electrification to rural areas. They constitute what I, will be what I will be referring to community development initiatives. But past studies have emphasized uh, food prices, the nutritional impact of food prices, incomes and food distribution. And it appears in the literature, markets, the presence of markets and community development initiatives. These have not enjoyed popularity in the uh, literature. So in this study, what we try doing is to address the generic issue of costs, that transaction costs, as opposed to just transportation costs, which, which and a lot of studies focus on transportation costs. So, I mean, that is actually the niche of uh, the current study, looking at uh, how policy can target uh, community uh, markets in communities and then uh, community development initiatives, how to use that to affect household food security and nutrition. So that is the gap we have seen in the literature and that is what the study uh, tried uh, feeling. If we come to the situation of Ghana, uh, we have about 50% of uh, child deaths being accounted for by undernutrition. Up to 8.5% of households, they suffer moderate to severe food and nutrition insecurity. Then with a lot going up to over 24% going without sufficient food. So community markets and interventions, such as what we are looking at, the community farm storage and rural electrification, 
they are the heart of uh, policies in Ghana to deal with this. So we use the self round of the Ghana Living Standards uh, data set, and it consists of uh, nearly 17,000 households in 1,200 uh, enumeration areas. So in terms of descriptive statistics, I just talk about the outcomes and then the policy intervention. The outcomes, we used house, uh, the food consumption score as an indicator for food security, and then use the food consumption score nutrition in terms of protein, vitamin A, and then ion to, uh, to as an indicator of the level of nutrition. Then in terms of policy intervention also, we looked at a situation where none of the interventions we are looking at exist. And we had that in about 42 uh, com of the communities we used. They didn't have any of these interventions. Then we looked at community development initiative only and about 9% of how, uh, of communities had that, then uh, whether the household resides in a community with functional uh, community market, and that one, uh, that count, accounts for 23% of the data we used. And a combination of the two, we had 26% uh, accounting for that. In terms of the food consumption score, we had the average to be 62.72, and that is uh, generally good, but it highs uh, individual individual heterogeneities in the data set because 62.72 actually indicates that uh, the food uh, security situation in Ghana is good. But as we'll see soon, there are individual heterogeneities. So the, this average is hiding the real issue. So I take a, I go through our methodology briefly by first looking at the theoretical framework. We considered we use the utility maximization function where we said that utility uh, is dependent on some key factors that is consumption of uh, food consumption, non-food consumption, and then uh, some uh, control factors. So from this utility function, we then have this indirect utility function, which is a function of prices and then income in particular price of food, price of non-food, and then uh, household income. We use expenditure, household expenditure as an indicator of uh, household income. So from that indirect uh, demand function that we can, uh, indirect utility function, we derive the corresponding demand functions and they are equations three and four. So the equation three is a, uh, the demand function for food, which is a function of price, the prices, and then income, and then non-food demand. Now, these the interventions are expected to uh, deal with transaction costs. So in the presence of the interventions, rather with the interventions, given transaction costs, we expect that they will increase demand for food, demand in terms of food security, they will increase uh, nutrition security. And that is what is shown here. Uh, for community markets in its presence, we expect that once it, it will deal with transaction cost issues, then demand for uh, food security and then nutrition should go up. The community development also has a positive effect on the demand. We, we used uh, the, this latent variable model, like that is equation five, but ultimately we, we modeled it as a multinomial logic using uh, equation six. And I mean, we used the model by Buagnon et al. 2007 to attempt to deal with some selectivity issues. So, and then, in particular, the interest is for us to be able to attribute, see the effect of the interventions on uh, food security and also nutrition. And that is that gives us this equation eight. The equation eight is actually having, looking at a situation where we have the uh, intervention, which is 7A, and then finding the counterfactual situation, which is 7B so that 
uh, the equation eight is actually seven A minus seven B. That gives us the average treatment effect due to the intervention. I show some results here, but what I want us to take note of in particular is what we looked at in the analytical framework, the effect of income, in this case, expenditure on the uh, food consumption score, for example, in the case across the interventions, whether there's an intervention, community development, a, a community market, uh, or the combination of the two, we see that income exerts positive effect on demand. Then price. After all, in the model, we also uh, saw uh, price as a factor. Price also is negative, is consistent, whether there's an intervention or not. So we see that income or expenditure and price exerts, they have significant effects on food security and demand for uh, nutrition. We control for other factors, but what I also want to point out at this point is these uh, parameters we have here, they are actually the selectivity parameters. We see that they are significant, but what is important here is that they present some mixed uh, signs and that also has implications on policy. I move on to the impact of the intervention strategies. We see in Column, in column four, we have percentages of uh, the effects, but three actually gives us the impact, the average treatment effect. We see that whether on food consumption score, on protein demand, on vitamin A demand, or iron demand, all the, both interventions, that's community development intervention, exerts positive effect on uh, demand, whatever the thing it is, whether it is food security or nutrition. Then community market intervention also exerts positive effects. But what is significant is that the, the combination of the two exerts much more positive effect than the sum of the individuals. But again, community development intervention, the effect across board, it, we see that community development intervention has a higher effect, a larger effect than com, uh, community market uh, intervention, except the case of uh, vitamin A, where uh, community market intervention has a higher effect. So in effect, these interventions, the interventions we are looking at, they exert positive effect on uh, food security and then demand for nutrients as shown by our uh, column four here. Now, from the analytical framework, we saw that uh, the effect of these interventions on demand for nutrients or food security, we saw that it, it, uh, these interventions affect the demand through at least price and income. So what we sought to do here was to investigate the impact uh, mechanism. We know that income, I mean, given a lot of the people are poor, increasing income is expected to increase their consumption of food and nutrients. But what we see here in this first graph, we see that, let me explain this. The dotted line here is the case of no intervention. The, this second one is the case of a community uh, development intervention. And the Y2 is the outcome of a functional community markets. And then the combination of the two is the Y4. What we actually see here is that the combination of the two interventions and then the Y3, which is this line, they exert a significant and positive effect on demand for food consumption. But the effect, their effects are weak when we go to the individual nutrients. So what this is portraying is that uh, in terms of demand for food or food security, we see income we see, uh, what's the name? Uh, we see those two uh, interventions, the community development intervention and the combination of the two exerting a positive effect. But in, in that regard, the, the uh, what's the name? The community market does not really play a role here. Then in, we also looked at the 
potential outcomes and then local food price index. We, we uh, investigated that to see whether price is also a mechanism through which the interventions affect uh, the outcomes we are looking at. And whether in the food consumption group or the, uh, fruit, uh, the nutrient rich uh, food consumption groups, we see these, uh, we see flatter graphs here. So all the interventions indeed, they affect food consumption and demand for nutrients through uh, price. Let me summarize, let me point, bring out the key findings here. Generally, we find that the implementation of these strategies significantly increase, uh, increases food security and nutrition of households. But we see contradictory signs on some selectivity terms suggesting possible inefficiencies from policy intervention distortions. Implementing a portfolio of interventions yields the highest impact on food consumption and nutrition rich food consumption. Prices and incomes are both important in explaining food and nutrition consumption scores mm -hmm. in all the intervention strategies, but the price effect on consumption is more, is more pronounced compared to the income or expenditure route, and we saw that. So to conclude, the impact of community development intervention is also consistently higher than that of functioning community markets in all the interventions, except vitamin A. Therefore, it pays to have a directed policy intervention meant to augment food consumption. Then choice of a particular policy intervention option is critical to support the extent of the policy impact, because we see that a combination of the uh, policies of the interventions have a higher impact than in the individual policies. So therefore, policy intervention options are more effective when implemented together, like I mentioned. And then finally, policy intervention comes at the cost of economic inefficiency in resource allocation, because projects are sometimes allocated to locations where some households end up being worse off. As such, there is the need for policy stakeholders to improve engagement with beneficiaries of uh, such policies. Thus, we reach this conclusion from the selectivity parameters, the mixed effects of the selectivity parameters. Thank you so much for listening and for the opportunity to present this. Mark, over to you. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Paul. Uh, you have kept the time uh, and that is great for us. So what we will do, just take note of uh, points or your questions, uh, members. You could also put them on the chat. Then once we are done with the second presentation, we will open up for Q and A. So let me allow uh, Professor Gemma to do his presentation, then we'll combine the reactions. Welcome, Professor Gemma. Yeah, thank you. I'd like to thank uh, AERC uh, first to, I mean, for giving me the chance and also for uh, uh, the fund to, to do this research. Uh, the title of uh, my project was the impact of agricultural commercialization on child nutrition uh, in Ethiopia. Actually, the time uh, given was like 10 minutes in uh, uh, the schedule is sent us and uh, I mainly focused on the, uh, not uh, the model part, but uh, on, the, on the outcome of uh, the results of the study. Uh, I have a background, uh, the, the presentation outline, rationale, a conceptual framework, uh, research questions, uh, the empirical strategies followed, the key findings of the study, and then uh, uh, the conclusion and policy policy implications. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so under nutrition and nutritional deficiencies uh, in general remain uh, burdens in developing countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, children pay the heaviest toll, uh, and the nutrition is a cause for uh, almost 45 percent of all the diseases uh, of under five children in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, child malnutrition, it has an adverse effect on child's future potential, uh, the negative impacts on uh, physical structure and uh, educational and cognitive development in general, and productivity and future earnings. It also 
take children and communities into a cycle of intergenerational poverty and uh, entrenched inequalities, and improving child nutrition and breaking the generational cycle of uh, malnutrition uh, has a crucial implications uh, for human capital development, increasing productivity and income. So these uh, demands actually investing in nutrition sensitive policies where uh, the dual role of agriculture in nutrition as both source of income and diverse uh, food consumption has to be taken into account. And uh, nutrition policies, most nutrition policies in um, uh, earlier times focused on the health sector with no equal push to align them with uh, the agricultural sector where agriculture has been, uh, I mean, slow to respond to actually uh, many, the many problems of malnutrition in, uh, in this uh, region. When it comes to Ethiopia, uh, yeah, food insecurity and malnutrition are long-standing pressing issues, uh, where uh, uh, about 35% of uh, under five children are suffering from chronic malnutrition. And uh, it is also rated as critical or very high for underweight uh, and wasted. And uh, generally, about 51% of uh, child deaths in Ethiopia is due to uh, undernutrition. Uh, child malnutrition also costs Ethiopia like 16.5% of GDP, or uh, like 1.85 billion USD uh, every year. Uh, and uh, yeah, taking this into account, the government's uh, target actually to reduce stunting by to 26 percent in 2020, but uh, uh, in this study, it is like still 36 percent. And uh, where the minimum uh, millennium development goals targets also 25 percent. And uh, moreover, policies, both GT food, this is a gross transport, uh, tra transformation plan one and two, put uh, actually commercialization as a main policy tool to reduce uh, food security and also uh, food and nutrition security. Why this study? Uh, the rationale is, uh, <clears throat> first it is, uh, yeah, governments may, uh, this is because commercialization affects uh, the degree of food availability at the national, community, and household levels. It also provides alternative strategies for rural house to improve diets through increase in income and diversified production. And it is the most effective means of dealing with poverty, food insecurity, and nutrition. Uh, it also supports uh, the country's plan to actually transform from agricultural to to industry-led uh, growth. Moreover, the uh, recent studies by Ogutu uh, and Rajenko and Coral also contain agricultural productivity and nutrition can better be answered through uh, commercialization. It also affects the diversity of food to be produced and this nutritional intake. Uh, it increases income and hence households' ability to purchase a diverse range of food items. And uh, also, uh, yeah, mixed results uh, were found by different studies on uh, the impact of commercialization on child malnutrition. If pre, yeah, found a positive effect in the 1990s, uh, but uh, later on in 2013, say the study by Wood, Ital, uh, Mofia, Mukuku uh, found a negative effect of uh, agricultural commercialization. Carlote found uh, an insignificant effect. Yeah, Kujupers in 2018 found a positive, negative, or zero, depending upon actually, uh, he, he considered three countries and uh, found uh, these results. And uh, these studies found significant and positive effect of agricultural commercialization on how soil nutrition in Kenya and Malawi. In uh, the Ethiopian context, except uh, this study, uh, we used actually two years uh, panel data and fixed effects model only, only yeah, which has its own limitation in impact analysis. Uh, others used cross-sectional data and substandard econometric methods, such as uh, ANOVA logit model in their analysis. 
However, this study used large panel data sets and rigorous econometric techniques such as GPS. This is generalized propensity score matching where the treatment uh, is continuous. The fifth fixed effects model and also random effects model, a logit, a logit model were used uh, to capture actually the differential impacts of uh, crop commercialization, the impact pathways, the endogeneity, heterogeneity, and selectivity bars, which is very common in these types of studies. As to the contributions, um, Generally, to our understanding of the way through which agricultural commercialization will contribute to nutrition, this is, uh, or in general, agriculture's contribution to, to nutrition. And also, there is a policy discourse, as I mentioned earlier, uh, on uh, yeah, commercialization as, as nutrition sensitive uh, policy and the use of large panel data sets uh, to control for for a variety of household individual characteristics, both observable and unobservable surface, and the institutional factors. And also the additional contribution is, uh, which, which I actually, based on the comments I received from workshop, I added the impact pathways, like uh, four types of uh, impact pathways through which Actually, uh, commercialization affects uh, affects uh, child malnutrition, and uh, this gives actually direction or which pathway to target by policy makers. Uh, this is a conceptual uh, framework of the study. Uh, yeah, the nutrition sensitive agricultural policies uh, has recently been uh, implemented in different countries. Uh, where agricultural commercialization is one, and the agricultural com commercialization actually affects uh, the choices of uh, the, the types, uh, the technology to be used, and factor intensity, which also affects crop uh, production for own consumption, crop uh, commercialization, uh, the value of uh, the crops to be sold, to harvested, and the crop production for market. Uh, I, I mean, agricultural commercialization has uh, two effects. One is uh, for sale and the other one is uh, the change in the types of uh, products to be uh, consumed from own, from own production, which uh, has a direct impact on child uh, nutrition. But uh, the production for the market, actually, uh, uh, there will be change in uh, income from crop sales, which affects the gender roles. Yeah, most of the studies found that uh, the income from crop sales uh, or from commercialization is controlled by, by, male, headed, uh, by male households, which affects uh, child and household nutrition. And uh, the gender roles is uh, who controls the income, will affect child malnutrition, and it also affects women's time, the food to be purchased in terms of quantity, quality, and variety. So this is generally the, the structure. So it means we have an impact, and there are different uh, impact pathways uh, that leads to uh, improved child malnutrition or, uh, or also uh, the adverse effects. These are the main research questions addressed in this study. Uh, does agricultural commercialization as a nutrition sensitive agricultural policy improve the uh, under five uh, children uh, nutritional outcomes? And to what extent are own produced food uh, replaced by purchased food due to crop commercialization? And how does this affect actually uh, the nutritional outcomes of children? To what extent are increased income from crop commercialization translate into consumption of nutritious uh, food? And does uh, yeah, crop commercialization adversely affect gender laws in the household and his uh, child nutritional outcomes? Now, when it comes to methodology, uh, this is uh, categorized Gemma, into Gemma, you, are, you are done with the 15 minutes already. So just summarize, please. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. 
Uh, Maybe just go to the results. Uh, or the conclusion part. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Just summarize, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the summary is that smallholder commercialization intensity is low, but comparable with other African countries. Uh, Ethiopia falls under high child and nutrition rates in all the indicators uh, considered. Male uh, child are more malnourished compared to female. Child and nutrition is higher for rural compared to small towns. Significant regional variations and also temporal variations. Stunting tends to decrease over time while underweight. Uh, uh, yeah, crop significantly reduced underweight uh, in wasting, the short term uh, nutritional outcome, but not stunting. Uh, and uh, crop commercialization as a nutrition sensitive agriculture has no uniform effect on uh, child uh, undernutrition, where uh, lower level of uh, from uh, crop commercialization have beneficial effect on all child uh, nutritional outcome, though both medium and higher levels were found to have mixed effects. For stunting, it is only medium and higher level of uh, commercialization, uh, yeah, but which reduced uh, stunting and the overall effect remained uh, insignificant. For underweight and wasting, moderate level and higher level of uh, crop commercialization have non beneficial and beneficial effects, respectively with the overall significant uh, beneficial effect. When it comes to impact pathways, uh, this shows significant beneficial cause effect of uh, crop commercialization in reducing uh, child undernutrition. It is explained by the significant crop income enhancing effect of commercialization. And uh, the significant effect of crop com commercialization on stunting can be explained by adverse effects uh, of commercialization on women's control over income. And generally, findings show that commercialization doesn't lead to substitution of purchased food for own produced foods, but more commercial uh, farmers add purchased food to their diet instead. Policy implications uh, should consider intensity of commercialization, enhancing market access and asset ownership are key strategies. Women may lose uh, decision-making power with increasing levels of commercialization, which may possibly be actually prevented through more gender sensitive uh, approach and awareness building. Specific regional, locational, time, age sensitive policies need to be designed. And finally, empowering women to have control on income from commercialization, improving the mix of own produced food towards household diets, and improving the distribution of incomes from commercialization for marginal household members are uh, recommended. Sorry for taking my time. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor. Um, actually, you have tried because I saw your slides were very, very many. So, all the same, you have the, you have you have tried. So, uh, members, I would like us to open up uh, the session would like you to shoot one or two questions to each of the presenters. We have Paul who presented earlier on on access to community markets and household food security in Ghana, and now on commercialization uh, and the impact on uh, nutrition outcomes for children in Ethiopia. So we open up uh, for a short while, probably about five minutes or so one or two questions for each of the presenters. Who is ready to shoot the first question? We have one question at the chat and uh, Claire is asking, could you talk about the interactions you have had with government about these pieces of research and how you see this contextual work contributing to policy changes? Maybe Paul, you can attempt that. All right, thank you. The expectation was that we will organize uh, a kind of a national uh, dissemination workshop or something. But nevertheless, we, we did uh, this uh, policy brief from that. Now, we did send this around and we are hoping that Ghana's nutrition policy and even the current uh, the agricultural policy is being reviewed. We are hoping that this will make uh, it will make an impact in the review of these policies. 
Thank you. Okay, let, let me help you then. Uh, members in uh, March 2020, yeah. we had a big senior policy seminar okay. in Abuja, Nigeria, attended by about 150 or so senior policymakers from 37 African countries. We shared these pieces of research to the policy uh, makers and the practitioners. Of course, we are not so sure about how it trickles down, but they did commit that uh, they will give priority to nutrition issues, nutrition policies in their countries. So this is how we interact. We interacted with the senior policymakers from uh, the region, the Sub-Saharan Africa region in 2020. Thank you. Yeah, nonetheless, we also use dissemination for like this conference, like uh, other conferences, the AAAE um, National Policy Workshops and so on. Thank you very much. Maybe in Yoguna, I can see you have... Uh, I, think, I think you can also add that in every paper, we have a policy brief. And this becomes very important because we are yeah, easy to send a policy brief to targeted audience because it gives you a quick read so that you can understand what it is. But at the same time, I think we also have conference proceedings and who was there, which makes it, makes it easy for us to follow up with the senior policymakers who are there. What we do is to show them what is the frontier knowledge and then what is the evidence coming from the case studies and how do we design the policy interventions? And we do ask them to commit and then we follow up with their commitment, sharing the commitment uh, that we, we make, we write up all the issues. So that is very, very important in terms of the interactions. Probably we can also share, share the policy briefs with the, with the ANH community because uh, we have the links to this. So uh, Bada, maybe you can uh, organize, we can share with uh, Jocelyn or uh, um, Claire and she will share with the community, the ANH community, so that anyone can read the briefs they are available. And also, even for our researchers to know how to develop the, the briefs, we train them to write policy briefs. Good. With okay, there is uh, somebody writing P Mulmi with mixed results for impact of agricultural commercialization on nutrition outcomes. How do you see? uptake of intervention in government institutions. Maybe Gemma, you can take, uh, uh, you can try an, an attempt an answer for that. Okay. Yeah, the mixed uh, result is uh, actually agricultural commer commercialization significantly reduced uh, the short term uh, nutritional outcomes. Uh, underweight and uh, and uh, wasting, but it has no significant effect on on stunting. And in the recommendation, this could be due to uh, the effect of commercialization on uh, women's role, where uh, actually the, that if woman controls income from uh, from commercialization, then uh, I mean, uh, the nutritional outcomes uh, will be improved, both the household and, uh, and child nutritional outcomes. To policymakers, the recommendation is to work on improving women's control of uh, the income from commercialization so that crop commercialization could have even a significant impact on uh, the long term. Uh, nutritional outcome that is stunting. Members, we don't have much more time. I think we have just have a minute or so. Let us leave it there. Members, let us uh, just conclude. We will share these materials. Uh, I know uh, the time was very short, but nonetheless, we have tried to utilize it very well. Uh, therefore, maybe Njoguna, if you have a final remark, 30 seconds probably you can make and then we will release members to other sessions of the conference. No, 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 I think I've done enough. I thought we had three papers. Oh, or am I not counting properly? They were three, but uh, the time and also he has not appeared up to now, so we will not- Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. okay. Now I can only thank Craig for steering this very well. Thank you very much for that. 
we look forward to participating and even uh, having joint sessions together and even joint research work. That is what we do for capacity building in Africa. And we do hope that uh, A and H Academy can be part of our collaborative team. Thank you very much. So thank you members, thank you everyone. Thank you, Claire, thank you, Jocelyn. Joy Yates, I saw you. We have Bada, our colleague in ARC, the presenters, uh, Professor Gemma and uh, Paul. Thank you so much. God bless you and let's meet again when we get the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone. Thank you. It was a really excellent and really interesting um, yeah, research that you presented. It's fantastic. Thanks so much.